can say. We're going to call the recommended meeting to order. Um, are we in compliance with the meeting law? Yes, we are. Okay, having said so, we'll move to the first line item of business, <laughs> which is bill number 2013 46 for possible action on the Unified Development Code to update the standard and procedures for obtaining approval of early grading permits. This is sponsored by uh, Director of Building and Safety, Chris Knight. Staff? Good morning. Good morning. Chris Knight, Director of Building and Safety. This bill is uh, a bill in response to several requests that we have received from uh, contractors that because of the economic conditions, uh, uh, they have projects that have taken, uh, they, they had put on delay, they got, they're wanting to get moving on them. Um, some of their plans weren't approved, but they wanted to do early grading. In the code, it talks about all the approvals that you have to have for early grading. Uh, some of the other entities, such as the county and Henderson, allow early grading. Our code did not. Uh, we are recommending that the code be amended to allow the Director of Public Works or his designee, which would typically be me, uh, to allow early grading. Uh, provided uh, several things are done. Tentative map approval is, is, is accomplished. They have a site development approval. It's not in the hillside area, uh, so that we don't have severe grading being done. Um, they submit a letter of justification uh, talking about a hardship that has delayed their project. Many times our outside agencies uh, that review those plans for utilities take a, a, a considerable amount of time in reviewing the plans and hold them up. And uh, if they're, uh, they have a drainage study done, they have a traffic study done, traffic impact, um, and they're very close to getting ready for, for final mylars, we would allow for early grading, and that's what this bill allows for. It's part of moving the project forward. Uh, they can get started on their grading at their own risk and uh, uh, get, their get their project started even earlier. Be happy to answer any questions. Is there anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? So please come forward and state your name for the record. Thank you, Todd Farmer, 241 19th Street. It's just that when they do the grading, between that and the start of the construction, that there's a lag time, there needs to be strict dust control out there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak on this item? If not, public hearing is closed. Councilman? Yeah, I have a question. If I may, uh, mm -hmm. Chris, look, I've been around here since before we had the uh, early grading prohibition. And the reason we had it was because we had dust bowls created every time some contractor would get in and scrape the ground. And then, you know, even, even if it didn't have problems, we got that done. And then sometimes when they promised the water, we don't water. Yes. We didn't water enough. So uh, there's a purpose for it. We cleaned up the air not having that problem with so much of that dust. So what are you going to do? They have to have a dust control permit with the with the air quality division of Clark County as part of this. How do we prevent? Well, let's see. Let's put it this way: somebody has some permission to build, but not enough. So he sees it, he, he sees where grading could help him, and you agree that grading could help him because he's got some permits that are coming down the line sometime. How do you know they are coming? Because that would be the key. If they're not from the health department, if they're not from us, let's say their county, their air pollution control, their health department, can you can you guarantee that you would know if you gave him permission to grade early and, and got dust control permit that in fact he really is just so far away from getting the final permission that in essence what he's got looks to you as if he's a slam dunk, yes. but it's going to take a month or two or three. Uh, you know, if you can guarantee that, I can see why we could go ahead and do this. And, and that's the reason that uh, we require civil improvement plans being ready for mylar submittal. That means they're they're ninety eight five percent complete with their plans. We're ready to approve them. Uh, they have to have a bond posted. They have to have the easements prepared, submitted to land development. They have to have all their agreements. They're all site improvement agreements, their encroachment agreements, their covenants running with the land and an at-risk letter from them and necessary approvals to comply with state law. And uh, so we know we're pretty comfortable that they are coming and we're pretty comfortable that they are building. They won't go through all of this trouble because it's expensive to get those plans uh, to that level. 
and they're not going to spend that kind of money and not go forward. Sometimes they run out of money. Yes, they do. They do. The economy's proven that. Yeah. Then they have to maintain the property the same as anybody else. How are they maintaining it now? I know it's happened. So, yeah. how do you have water being spilled on the desert right now by... Well, how, how does it work? Yes, sir. How does it work? Uh, uh, if there's a complaint to the to the uh, uh, air quality division, they have to go out and do it. Most of them treat it with a chemical that, that they don't have to go in water all the time. Uh, there is a chemical that the uh, uh, air quality division has, has approved that creates a crust that keeps the wind from blowing it away, and they can do that. If they're not going to go forward, we, we work with the air quality division to make sure that, that happens. The only way I can see that working is if they then fence it off or they prevent people from getting on the property so that they don't break the crust. That's another one of the requirements of the air quality people, folks. If you'll notice a lot of vacant parcels around town get, get fenced off or they have berms built on them so that you can't get on them. And that is a requirement of the air quality division. Right. Okay. I'm okay with that. Okay. Council? Move for approval. Aye. Aye. So moved. Bill number 201347-47 for possible action amendments in the development code to update the processes and requirements pertaining to the installation of common area and offsite improvements. This is proposed by Chris Knight. This again, uh, council members, is a uh, uh, effort on our part to try to expedite the, the development of single family subdivisions. Uh, there is a, a restriction in the code right now that says that when you get 75 percent of the building permits issued uh, for a subdivision, you have a hundred lot subdivision. To make the numbers simple, when you have 75 of those lots permitted, you have to have 100 percent of all of your common areas completed. Uh, common areas include the streets. Um, common areas include any any open space that you would have to be putting in or landscaping that would be required by the site development plan. <laughs> Uh, we have bonds in place for the streets, we, and we now include bonding for the landscaping and the amenities that go in. Uh, what we're asking for is if they are making good progress to be able to work with the contractor to allow them up to 90% instead of the 75% of the building permits. 90% will be, for lack of a better term, holy ground. We won't go beyond that. We've been working with D.R. Horton. You will remember that... Uh, uh, we think council council approved this point beyond the 75 percent uh, uh, with the uh, working on a specific project that they had had holding pending the, the economy and uh, they wanted to move forward and we've done it and they've been, we've been very successful with them they have performed so we propose to amend the ordinance to allow the director of public works or his designee uh, to work with the contractor to allow the permits to be issued over the 75 percent with a written agreement and it requires a, a signed written agreement with that contractor a timeline that they will be finishing those common improvements before they hit the 90 percent we have to answer any questions can we from the public wish to speak on the side so please come forward to state your name for the record seeing that council all in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Bill number 2013-48, possible action amends the special use permit standards applicable to second hand dealers in the town center district to allow the sale of firearms on both a consignment and non-consignment basis as well as the purchase and exchange of firearms. This is sponsored by Councilman Stephen D. Ross. Members of the committee, Flint Tag, Department of Planning. Uh, as you may be aware, in the town center area, we have very restrictive standards for second-hand dealers uh, that are much more restrictive than elsewhere in the city. Uh, we've got a request from Councilman Ross to amend the uh, items that can be sold at second-hand dealers to include firearms. And so staff has uh, developed this text amendment and we'll seek your support of it. Okay. I have a question for you. Yes. Do we allow the sale of firearms and secondhand dealers throughout the city of Las Vegas? Yes, we do. Okay. And so is this to align um, town center with the city of Las Vegas as a whole? Because prior, uh, the town center standards did not allow for 
the sale or the consignment sale of firearms? That is correct. So is that the only addition to yes. the ordinance that we're proposing here today? Yes. Okay. We're uh, now up for public comment. Anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item, please come forward and state your name for the record. Seeing none, Councilman? I have a question. Have we had any problem with the firearms tax and hand dealers in the rest of the town conforming to the property rules as far as registration? Not that I'm aware of, no. We've had no complaints filed with us. Uh, no business revocations or notices going on. Okay. Okay. So it's working then. Notification is working. I'm good for two Okay. All okay. in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Rule number 2013-49, possible action amends the Unified Development Code to update the standards applicable to live work units within the live work overlay district. This is sponsored by Councilman Bob Coffin. Staff. Flint Fag with the Department of Planning. We are proposing to make some rather substantive changes to our existing live work overlay ordinance. Uh, when it was originally adopted back in 2005, we had a very restrictive list of permitted uses that were allowed as part of a live work unit essentially limited to either office or arts-related uses. Uh, based on recent developments in the downtown area, we found the need to expand that list of permitted uses and also to address some of the conflicts that we've had between the zoning code and the building code for the work units. And so that's the basis, really, of the ordinance that you have before you today. This will do three things. Number one, as I've already mentioned, it will expand the list of permissible uses that you can carry out as part of the live work unit. Uh, this will help address some of the uh, interests that we've had over at the Jewel building, which has a number of live work units. Uh, there's an individual there, for example, who wants to do bicycle sales and rentals as part of a live work unit. And so this will allow those types of uses there. The second thing that it does is to uh, eliminate unintended conflicts between our building code and the zoning code relative to live work units. Um, there have been some issues relative to the amount of living space as part of the live work unit uh, and the separation requirements between the residential and the commercial. Uh, and so what we're trying to do with this ordinance is to bring the zoning code into alignment with the building code so that we don't have conflicts there. And that will make it easier for people to develop live work units. And then the third thing is to allow for greater flexibility in the configuration of the units. We had rather uh, restrictive language, if you will, relative to the residential component and the separation issues. Uh, and by opening that up a little bit, I think that will assist with some of the issues that we've had, uh, again, looking at the Jewel project, for example. And so with that, we would request your support and approval of these changes to part of the work overlay ordinance. Okay. Flynn, as it relates to the Jewel unit, you brought that up as an example. I understand that on the floor level, the ground level, uh, you have an opportunity to have the commercial space. Um, for whatever footage uh, they have from 600 to possibly maybe 1,500, 1,800 square feet at the bottom. But they do have access to go from the commercial up the staircase into the residential component. So help me understand um, the changes that would allow for one, should they choose to live in the above unit and still operate from a commercial standpoint on the ground level or the possibility of utilizing that upper area for um, storage and or um, flex space as it relates to um, um, wine and cheese for a gallery purpose. Yeah, that's one of the specific examples we have a request for. One of the things that we clarify in this is with the live work unit and specifically with the Jewel project, you do have the commercial access from the ground floor, from the exterior. One of the things that we want to be careful of is that we don't want commercial access through the residential hallways of the building. And with the Julie units in particular, the second floor residential space has access to a residential hallway. And so we've clarified in the language of the ordinance that all commercial access has to occur through the exterior at the ground floor as opposed to the residential hallways. So again, we have allowed greater flexibility in terms of how you use that space while still protecting other residents of the building by restricting commercial uh, access through the ground floor or through um, from the public rights of way. So in other words, are you saying as long as they keep the residential side of the door locked or protected and not allowing it to be used for an ingress and egress for commercial use purposes, then, then they're okay. Then they're okay? Yes. So in, so in other words, there would have to be some level of enforcement 
to, as far as from a complaint standpoint, as far as access from a commercial, for commercial use on the residential side? Correct. And one of the reasons, as part of the approval process, we have the requirement for a site plan review. And one of the reasons that we have that is so we can verify that there are proper protections in place in terms of restricting commercial access to the residential corridors. So, yes, there is a way for us to take a look at that and make sure that the unit is laid out appropriately in terms of separating the residential and commercial. So how often will this review take place? It's going to be on a complaint basis if there are any violations of how they've set up to operate. Okay. Thank you. Anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item, please come forward and state your name for the record. Yes, thank you. Todd Pollack, 240 North 19th Street. I think this is a great idea. And I also think it's ironic that downtown Las Vegas is going to be the town center rather than the town center. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else from the public wishing to speak on this item? If so, please come forward and state your name for the record. Seeing none, public comment is closed. Councilman? Thank you. I requested this bill to be drafted at the request of planning, and I think it's a good bill. But it's not wide enough. It's not broad enough. But I think we should move forward with this bill if we have the votes. Because I don't want to muddy up the issue here for Jewel and those people that need that help. But I believe we need to go farther. Oh, boy. Here comes the old guy talking again. BLM. I'm going to be the old man in the reality show. One of the reasons that downtown Las Vegas depopulated was because of the rents. You know, when this was a charming little town, you could do these kinds of things. You could have your offices downtown not far from your home. It doesn't work that way anymore. You've got to move out. And we made it so desirable to leave the downtown that everybody moved out into strip malls and into good planned centers, but many miles away from downtown. So downtown lost its soul, really, and became depopulated and crime ridden because there was nobody living there after 5 o'clock in the evening. So what I see, and I've been in a lot of towns where they don't even have this kind of regulation. Take Carson City, for example. They have a very charming neighborhood. The east side and the west side of Carson are Main Street as you go through there. It's an old Victorian area. A lot of old Victorian homes. The west side is early 20th century. And there are some businesses, very successful, charming businesses in these homes back there. And I don't know whether or not they have strict rules on live work there, but I think it's permitted. And I can give you an example. Comstock Books right behind the Supreme Court building. Old Bill's had that business there for many, many years, selling used and rare books. He lives behind, he lives, he has his little kitchen. He's got his bedroom and a shower. And he does that, and he comes on out every day and he does his business and it's browsing and it's attractive to people visiting downtown Carson City. There's lots of them like that there. You know, lawyers here, I mean, nobody's really getting rich right now downtown. I think of lawyers downtown who would probably be very, very well off if they could live behind their law office, you know, on 6th and 7th and 8th Street. Because, you know, I can see them, they have a community, they've got a cheap apartment somewhere else and they live out here and they put on a good front. But in fact, their well-being would be much better if they could live in their law office. I'm going to say, you know, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with having, you know, your living quarters behind your office? You know, you get your blue suit on and your tie and you're all shaved and you come out ready to sue every morning. The thing is, is that I've longed for a return to something which could continue to repopulate downtown. And I think we should consider, and I'd like to work with planning and call it on a further liberalization of these rules. I think we grew these rules up, who knows, 50, 60 years ago when God knows who we did not want to have doing business downtown. But now we'd like to have anybody, not just the arts business. Why not? So, I say, if somebody can show me a good reason why not, I think we should move forward with something more liberal. But not on this bill. I don't want to amend it. Unless I'm the prime minister. Unless you move forward. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Bill number 2013-50 for possible action amends the Unified Development Code to establish an alternative schedule and procedure for the submission and processing of tentative maps. This is sponsored by Councilman Stephen D. Ross. Again, please act as the Department of Planning. 
Currently in our code, we have a requirement that tentative maps cannot be submitted until 14 days after a site plan or rezoning has been approved for the property. Um, the reason for that is, number one, there is a limit in state law in terms of the approval period for tentative maps. They have to be approved within 45 days of submittal. And then secondly, if there's any changes to either the site plan or conditions upon the zoning, uh, those need to be addressed by definitive map, and so that's why the process has been separate. However, we have had requests from the development community to allow tentative maps to be filed in conjunction with either a rezoning or a site plan application, so that way our planning commission or our elected officials can see the tentative map and how it's going to lay out in addition to the zoning and the site plan. Um, by approving this ordinance, this will save approximately 30 days off of the entitlement time frame for subdivisions as long as no significant changes are needed to the tentative map in the approval process. And so with that, staff would request your approval of this proposed ordinance. Thank you. Anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? So please come forward and state your name for the record. See you Councilman. He says no. No questions. Okay. Move for approval. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. We're now down to bill number 2013 51 for possible action establishes licensing requirements and regulations as well as updated zoning regulations pertaining to short term residential rentals. This is sponsored by Councilwoman Lewis Tarpani. Seth? Flintside of the Department of Planning yet again. Um, last year, City Council requested that we review our existing short-term residential rental ordinance with them. We did that at the August 2012 City Council meeting and received direction from City Council at that time to make amendments to our short-term residential rental ordinance. Uh, and so finally, after a, a year of work on this, we have uh, this amendment before you. There are some major changes that I'll go through in our short-term residential rental ordinance. First of all, uh, one of the changes that we're making is we're transferring um, a lot of the current requirements from Title 19, the Zoning Code, to Title 6, the Business Licensing Code. And those are the items that really pertain to the operation of, of the business rather than the land use issues. Um, let me go through some of those changes. First of all, uh, there is going to be a change in the uh, license. The current code just identifies that a permit is needed. We are creating a short-term residential rental license, uh, and the fee for that will be $500 per year. Currently, applicants are paying either $100 per year or $300 per year. Um, room tax is still required for short-term residential rentals. We are, however, making this more parallel with our hotel and motel uses in that a register of guests is going to be required, a health permit is also going to be required, and fire safety inspection is also going to be required. Those are things that we currently do not require as part of short-term residential rentals. Um, we have also proposed an occupancy limit for short-term residential rentals based on the number of bedrooms and we do cap that at a maximum of 12 overnight guests uh, and no more than 18 daytime guests. This is similar to ordinances that we've seen elsewhere in the country, Palm Springs, Rancho Mirage, Lake Tahoe, uh, which also have restrictions on the number of no overnight guests. Uh, another thing that we are adding is vehicle restrictions. All vehicles associated with the rental must be parked on site and cannot be parked in the right of way and no commercial vehicles are permitted uh, to be parked there in the residential neighborhoods. Uh, in terms of noise restrictions, we have additional language that does not permit any amplification of sound outside of the rental unit, uh, and also reference Title 9.16 relative to the city's current noise restrictions. Another thing that we are adding is contact information. If there's any issues from neighborhood residents, Contact information in the rental unit must be displayed. Again, this is something that's done elsewhere in the country where they will have a placard which they'll display in an exterior window at the exterior of the property with a contact number um, with someone uh, available for response 24 hours per day. 
We also have regulations regarding trash cannot be stored in public view and must comply with our trash requirements in Title IX. And then one of the final things to assist with enforcement, some of the enforcement problems that we've been having. As you're aware, we just recently adopted civil penalties as part of our business licensing code. And so we do state here that four violations of the short-term residential rental requirements may result in either suspension or revocation of the license. So we feel that that's something that will also help in the enforcement of this ordinance. Uh, with that, uh, that uh, basically sums up the proposed changes, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. You know, for the public, if you wish to speak on the side of so please come for the station name for the record. Please come forward. Say your name Pete for the record. Pete Anello, property manager. Okay, spell your name, last name for me, please, for the record. A like Al Alpha, N like Nancy, E like Echo, L like Lima, L like Lima, O like Oscar. Thank you. Be glad to hear from you. Um, you know, one of the uh, issues that, that as a property manager that uh, is not being addressed, I mean, a, a lot of the problems. Uh, well, first of all, I'd say a lot of the problems in this bill uh, have been addressed, and I think it was uh, it's probably 90% there to solve a lot of the problems uh, that I have as a manager. Um, one of the things that, uh, a big problem that I have is just straight up uh, defiance by uh, a person renting the property. Um, you know, meaning that uh, we've been uh, you know, restricting uh, a property down to 14 occupants and somebody shows up with uh, 18 occupants and is there for three days. Um, as a manager, I'm very, like, uh, you know, handcuffed to saying, hey, you know, we're going to retain your security deposit, um, which causes, a, you know, kind of a chain reaction of, um, you know, other items, you know, disputes with credit cards. Um, nowadays, uh, you know, it's become such a society that, you know, people aren't dealing with cash. You know, we end up losing the disputes, um, you know, trying to calm down, like, noise and things like that. Um, we really have no, uh, you know, uh, way to, uh, you know, enforce uh, some of these uh, noise and occupancy, um, you know, uh, that tenants may uh, violate, which is ultimately, I think, what disrupts the neighborhood. So, um, you know, I'd like to see, like, you know, some form of you know, documentation uh, when uh, you know a tenant is in violation, so that uh, you know we're able to adequately uh, prepare documentation to you know retain deposits and, and make it a little bit more. Uh, and I'd actually like to see a, a, some type of penalty or revenue that's earned by the city when people do this, that we can pass that cost on. Um, you know, if. Uh, um, somebody's coming out from business licensing or something like that, you know, because of uh, something not being in compliance. Um, I would like to make the guilty party uh, accountable and not so much the, uh, you know, property owner who may not, uh, um, you know, be the responsible party. And my fear a little bit is with this bill is that, it, uh, you know, if you have 12 people that are renting a place for, you know, a couple thousand dollars maybe for, you know, four days, you know, even if you have a $1,500 security deposit split amongst 10 or 12 people, if they have a few extra people, it's really not a big deal for them just to eat the deposit and ultimately, you know, violate the uh, ordinance. So, um, I just would like to see, like, stiffer penalties, uh, you know, uh, a very uh, stern process so that, uh, you know, when uh, the neighborhoods are disrupted, that the uh, tenant um, is uh, who, in my opinion, from a management perspective, is 99% of the time the uh, guilty party that uh, they're held accountable for their uh, disregard of the uh, uh, ordinance. Um, the other thing is, is that um, they proposed uh, lowering the occupancy. Um, you know, it was based on you know bedrooms. Um, I think that. Uh, you know, I've had a couple clients that were looking for properties to, to purchase that were on uh, um, large lot sizes. Um, I think there's a, the way that the uh, current uh, bill is proposed with a cap of uh, 12 people. I think if you're somebody that's on an acre of property that has, you know, seven or eight bedrooms, I think that, you know, 12 people can be a little bit, uh, 
a little bit too restrictive. And I think that's about it. Okay. Thank you so very much. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, my name is Robert Rubin. Excuse me, my voice, but I just spent some 40 doses of radiation on my arms. Uh, I live across the street from 616 Campbell, which you list, you, you call a uh, short-term rental, and we neighbors call it a party house, because that's what it is. And the media calls them party houses. Um, as I list my complaints, uh, please imagine the house next door to you or across the street has become a short-term rental or a party house because this is what you can expect. Essentially, 616 Campbell is a Motel 6 in an RE zoned area. The west side of Campbell is RE. I live across the street and my zoning is RA. So it certainly isn't uh, a, a proper uh, zoning for a party house. Any Saturday night at our Motel 6, the property manager hasn't been answering his phone when we call about complaints. And we have plenty of them. Code enforcement doesn't work Saturday night. Metro is too busy to answer 311 or responds too late to view the infractions that we have called in. This is what you're going to encounter. Taxis at all hours of the day and night. Every time a taxi pulls up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, car doors slam, I wake up. They have a pool on the south side of the building. So many of the activities, it's a heated pool, many of the activities that take place in these parties is uh, at the pool. People are drinking and having a good time, which means we got lots of hooping and hollering. Could be 3 o'clock in the morning, could be 8 o'clock in the morning. 11.30 at night, we have a bus parked in front of the building on the street. Bus is necessary because there's so many people staying at that party house. There's too many for cabs, so they transport them back and forth to where they're going in a bus. 11.30 at night, I go out and listen to a very loud radio. It's in a bus waiting for 30 minutes with the engine running, the radio blaring. I speak to the operator of the bus. He says, look, I'm trying to earn a living. We're here to move people. Mind your own business. He will not turn it down. He will not turn it off. There's always loud exchanges or ver verbal arguments between occupants. We hear this all the time. Fire cr crackers. I timed it from 11.35 at night till 12.15. It wasn't 4th of July. Somebody was just setting off firecrackers. There were so many of them that out in the street it was all fogged in from the smoke. Escort services parked in front of the building with price bargaining going on in a loud manner. This has happened many times. The reason why I know this is that uh, I don't go to bed early. I, I walk my dog out there sometimes midnight, sometimes one in the morning, and I see this happening. There's a couple of girls in the car, the driver from the escort service in bargaining with the tenants in the party house, and it gets pretty loud. The girls go in, they look them over, they go back out in the car and move bargaining. So we got prostitution going on. 
Remember, this is an RERA area. All of these laws that you propose and ones that have been in existence, they're, they're all unenforceable. He, he mentions again, uh, he here admits it, and he runs the properties. These rules are broken at night when the code enforcement people aren't working. Metro's too busy, as I mentioned. So your laws aren't even enforceable that you have. I noticed here, too, in the uh, uh, brochure I just picked up, it talks about updated zoning. I don't see anything in the written portion of this thing that talks about zoning at all. I wish I could have seen that. 616, I think, rents for 1200 bucks a night. That's a lot of money. Now, you don't think mom and pop that come over here to see a show is going to pay 1200 bucks a night. What it is, is we've got 10 to 30 people from L.A. zooming in here to fight or whatever event they want to come to see. And 30 guys can split up 1200 bucks. It's cheaper than going to a hotel or a motel. So in summary, there shouldn't be any short-term rentals in Las Vegas at all. The other alternative is to have a lot of if we have a lot of them, the Nevada Resort Association will get involved, just like they did with Dobby's casinos. And they'll make sure that there aren't any short-term rent. So maybe we can go one way or the other. One last thought that I want to mention is that uh, everybody likes to live in a nice neighborhood. If mine gets too noisy or trashy, maybe on a Sunday I could take a little drive. But I can't drive by our mayor's house, because they live in a gated area. I can't drive by Lois Tarkanian's house, our councilwoman. Because she has her privacy because there's a gate and a guard at the gate to make sure that nobody bothers her. So there we are. That's all I have to say, and I want you to think about it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. I think she has some uh, pictures and things she wants to show you, and, and I'd like to go back. To that. That's okay. okay. Your name for the record? I'm Pat Flick, F-L-I-C-K. Okay. And um, Miss Pat Flick, uh, just a moment. So did you say your name for the record? Yes, I am sure. No, I'm talking to the gentleman here. I think I did. Well, okay, I just wanted to make sure. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Foote. I live at 612 Campbell Drive, right next to 616 Party Town. I have, and I would like to present, if I may, I'd like to give each one of you some documentation. Mm -hmm. You can use the gentleman behind you. Oh. And if you would go over my pictures and my portfolio of notes, which was recommended by the city that I keep track. Okay, then what is it that we're looking at if you don't if you don't look? No, we're not going to review we're not going to review that. We'll review what you've submitted before. So you can give that back to us. Okay. If you can just walk us through what we have here, that would be helpful. I'm here, you'll see where it lists the salary. I mean I'm sorry. It lists the rent, twelve hundred dollars a month. I, I, $500 a day or 5500 per week. It also lists the interior, 10 bedrooms, 10 baths, 6 downstairs, 2 fireplaces, 11 king-size beds, 3 queen-size beds. If you look at the county documentation, it says bedrooms, a total of 5. Bathrooms, a total of 6. In the original documentation, sleep count, 28 which I now believe they took down to 14. So who do you think is going to patronize this? Well, we've had the guys and gals from the Motor Speedway with their funny cars and other cars lining the driveway. We have uh, convention people who, by the way, broke my gate out in front. They thought it was the party house, 9 o'clock at night. I have a gate that's Across my driveway, they sprung it. 
And thank you, Pete. They did come around and give me some consideration. It cost us about $3,500, $3,500 to fix it. They gave me $300, and I'm very appreciative of that consideration. So we have these groupies. We have them from outside the state. We have them from outside the country. I've had people come over asking me to call because there's no telephones in the house. And their foreign telephones don't work. Numerous times I have called taxi cabs to pick them up. I have gone by, as a good neighbor, picked up their trash because at one time they only had one trash receptacle. Remember, originally 2012, we're talking of 28 or more people there. So they had baggies all over, trash flying, pizza boxes, beer cans. I go and pick some up on trash cans. I would also contact their grounds person, their maintenance person. Tell them, hey, you've got water running out to the drive. By the way, your gates are flung out, flung out over the curb. You need to pull them back. You need to get them fixed. They have double swing gates. They don't work. So it's the letters who sometimes swing them out. There's all sorts of problems that go on. I'm 74 years old. My son and I bought this place in 2003. We will die there. But we cannot put up with this type of party house. This is the historical area. We're proud of it. Equestrian estates, we have our meetings. I'm lock captain out of Bolton Station. Bolton Command is my station. We should have police reports, 311 reports from various neighbors in the community. We love our community. We want our community back. And I ask any one of you, sitting or standing, would you like a party house next to you? You never know who's going to be there that night. I've had balls come over. I've had the uh, team from Washington, where the owner lives, by the way. I've never met him. I've never seen him. He is not always available. You call the number, and it will say, don't leave a message. You call the number another time. You, you're given a long-distance number to call. I'm not calling a long-distance number to complain. I have tried to get a hold of them. Sometimes I get a hold of them. We've had a couple walk-arounds. I'm asking you, for the safety of all those tenants, who's watching out for them? They have a heated pool. Is there somebody that's licensed to take care of that pool? Uh-uh. Is there regular maintenance on the grounds? Uh-uh. I tell them they need water. I told them when I pruned my palm trees. I have 32 palm trees in my yard. My house is a 1980 house. So is theirs. Mine was built by the contractor. It's one story. It looks like two stories. We put a lot of extras in my house. I've been in that house. When it was up for sale, it didn't sell. It was foreclosed by Nevada State Bank. Was it Nevada State Bank? Nevada Bank. They bought it at foreclosure, 600000 It was up to $3.2 million. You know, this is ridiculous. It can't go on. Give us back our community. It was Tarpanians right up the street on the end. Mayor Goodwin is over a few blocks. We're a small community. We love our community. Boston School is right down the street on Palomino. We've had party houses next to Lois, Pinto, Palomino. What are we setting? Is the county so much ahead of us? At least they have six months rental. Not by the day. You never know who's going to be over there. I've had balls in the yard. I've had people attempting to come over the ball. I have a buzzer out in front. I have my address in two different places. A few weeks ago, I went over and I paid to have somebody fix our rod arm. Our adjoining rod arm. I had somebody paint it. I didn't ask for consideration on that. I did ask them if I supply the paint, would they paint it? Two or three months later, they still hadn't painted. I went over and got my paint can from the maintenance guy. Now, I've heard from the maintenance guy. He's got a lot of houses to cover. Sure, if you look at their ad, they've got rentals. they got property for sale. 
in the state, outside the country. Pete, I'm sure, is very busy. He doesn't have time to come over. You know? So who is going to inspect it? Who is going to make sure that they live up to what your new regulations are? They haven't so far, even with the previous regulations. Are there fire protectors in the room? He had a break-in from the roof, I understand. I stole a lot of digital. He's got a lot of money involved in there. He's got a, a flat roof, so every time it rains, the rain comes in. The county has it listed as a concrete tile. There's no concrete tile, so the county's messed up. I'm sure there's mold. They've got landscaping above the windows in the living room. Who takes care of the thing? Who protects the residents? Who protects the tenants for a big fee like that? And it is a party house. They come. I've seen groupies there. I've seen them walking up and down the driveway. We've had boom boxes playing from 12 to 2 in the morning, sometimes as late as 4 in our driveway. That's where our two bedrooms are. Noise from the pool. They've tried, but they don't know. You can't reach them by telephone. Are they going to be over there at 2 and 4 in the morning? I don't think so. So I have a blocked telephone number. The latest was, unblock your telephone or send me a text. And I'm 74 years old. I'm not doing texting. You know? I'm not there. And am I supposed to keep reporting to them? I report to Bolin every first Tuesday. I see Mr. Garrow over several times. They tried to help me. What the, can they do? So don't let the county override us. Let's do something in our city. Be proud of it and do it. That summarizes. I thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk in front of us. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, I, uh, I am Jewel Dixon, uh, significant other. It lives at 616 Campbell Drive. Pat and I have been together for a long time. And uh, I have, um, I, I just can't understand why the city would license an in and out motel next to us. And that's exactly what it is. There's loud noises, there's parties, there's wedding receptions, there's disc jockeys out there, there's fans. Boom boxes till four o'clock in the morning. I've been waking up many times with that. Uh, doping going on. Uh, ladies of the night uh, coming in and uh, with taxis. As Bob says, buses all times of night, easily down the street. Uh, there's just no peace and tranquility. We pay for that. We pay for peace and tranquility when we bought that house, but we don't have it. Uh, ever since they uh, sold that at auction and made it an in-and-out motel. Uh, there's 20 people that stay over there often. Uh, and they, they even had the hockey team in. And the hockey team was about 20 people, I think, at one time. Had to have a huge bus to take them in and out. And why would the city license an in-and-out motel uh, next to us? Would one of you vote to have one of them? Next to you. The one hour response, that's a joke. You can't even get them to answer the telephone in 24 hours. That pretty well summarizes what I, what's been said here and what I've had to say. And I just wish the city could uh, find a way to move forward on this and protect the people that move there to live there. And, and, Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak on this item? If so, please come forward and state your name. Am I able to respond to anything that's been said? I'm sorry? Am I able to make any type of response to add to what has been said? Or you, you mean as far as a rebuttal? Uh, not so much a rebuttal, but just uh, um, uh, okay. slightly a rebuttal. But uh, Okay, will you be addressing that to this panel? Uh, I would be. Okay, go ahead. I was going to say is that you know our phone system that's set up. No matter if, uh, you know somebody leaves a message any time tonight. Um, State your name for the record again. Uh, first name is Peter. Last name is Anello. Thank you. Um, the phone system that we have set up. Um, no matter what number that you call, you know we get a digital printout that will come to several people that work for the company, several property managers, and um, 
you know, something like that, that type of system, and, and I hear certain things that um, we don't get our messages and stuff like that, we have a record and we keep a record. Um, that would, might be something that uh, might be advantageous to put into um, the existing ordinance um, because uh, I'm yet to receive a call from either uh, you know, anybody that's here in the middle of the night, um, whether it be a digital message or a phone message that says, hey, listen, this place is you know, rocking. Because we have people uh, you know, available who can be assigned to answer the phone um, you know, 24 hours a day. So, um, you know, I think this kind of comes back a little bit, a lot of this to this enforcement aspect and really, you know, keeping the uh, tranquility of the neighborhood. Um, when I hear stuff like this, I mean, it, you know, I wouldn't personally want to live next to uh, somebody, uh, you know, with, with boom boxes and things like that. But unfortunately, the communication, um, in my opinion, has been to the police in order to try and create records to and short-term rentals and there's never the communication is not been um, you know I haven't got calls messages anything at 1 o'clock in the morning saying there's a DJ set up because you know the leases and all these things are set up very strict to um, you know keep garbage out of uh, you know the site of the front yard you know to you know um, we don't even allow somebody to park you know uh, in front of the property um, even though they, they legally can't do everything on the property, just to try and you know maintain the uh, you know peace of the neighborhood. So um, you know, with the enforcement aspect, you know, there, there needs to be a clear process for enforcement and reporting these issues, so that a property manager can actually do their job and control you know some of these uh, issues because. It's only meetings like this that I find out some of these things are happening. Otherwise, I, I mean, it's like when somebody says there's a DJ over there or there's 30 people there. There's, I mean, to me that I, I mean it's it's hard to believe. But then again, it's not hard to believe because I know how sometimes people just do whatever it is that they, you know, feel the need to do, you know, at that given time. So um, I think that's it. Thank you, Mr. Mel. Yes, sir. Thank you, John Carlo, two forty North Pine Street. Anthony has a gizmo that shows a picture of the, uh, of the property, and it's absolutely beautiful. And then this gentleman here, he just explains that it's an absolute a house from hell. I would, for a person to live next door to that is just outrageous. Outrageous to subject anybody like this. And how the property, the other thing, let's, let's cut to the chase. How in the world are you ever going to, enforce a, a, a numbers violation. There's no way of doing that. The other thing about that, there's no code enforcement for members at, at night. Code enforcement's a joke. And Metro, they're a joke too. They take an hour and 40 minutes to respond to an emergency situation. I mean, this is incredible. And for a person to, I have a house that has no value at all. And I would hate to, to live next door to something like that. This is outrageous. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak on this item? So please come forward to say your name for the record. Say none. Every comment. I, I think if you look at these pictures, you state your name for the record, sir. Will yes, sir. I think if you look at these pictures, you will see the garbage in the streets. You will see the buses. You will see the pictorial Mr. Lewis, of what's going on. Mr. Lewis, pass the pictures for quick. And uh, any, anything else, sir? Because I'm closing public comment. That's it. Thank you. Another three minutes close. Uh, we'll have, uh, I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, Peter, Peter, if you don't mind remaining, um, we have a comment coming from Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I think you mentioned fun, this is like a year ago when we started this conversation about the short term rentals and. Uh, um, there were some issues and some problems occurring, and um, my, my first instinct was uh, I don't think we should have any short-term rentals in the city. I mean, that's, I think I, that's what I said in the briefing, but the kind of the consensus was, well, you know, we're okay, we just have to have more restrictions, and you've done that. So what you did, your job, based on the comments that you were hearing from a lot of folks, and, and I mean, there's a lot of good restrictions here, but I'm telling you, um, I don't think we should have short-term rentals in the city of Las Vegas. I mean, uh, 
I wouldn't want one of these next to my house. And there's nobody in this room that would raise their hand saying they would want a short-term rental next to their house. I guarantee you that. Um, and so that's kind of the, my personal aspect. I wouldn't want to have one of these next to my house. And but my, you know, my law enforcement experience is that these short-term rentals, they are party houses. I mean, that's 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 what they do. They're uh, they're hotels, and people come and go all the time, and and uh, they have parties, and they come to Las. They don't people don't come to Las Vegas to uh, sit around the house. <laughs> they come to Las Vegas to have a good time. So. Um, I understand what you did here, and you did a good job, but um, if there's any appetite, I would, uh, I would, I don't know how we would do this, but uh, I don't, I'm not sure how I would vote on this because I want to ban them, so I don't know if, if we would, how would you do that, Val, if we, there was a consensus to ban short-term rentals? Would you just vote no on this item and come up with a new ordinance, or... Uh, you can I would either propose a tax amendment, a ban the thing, or how, how exactly procedurally, just so I understand that. Well, Steve, Deputy City Attorney, <laughs> um, you could pass the ordinance on an interim basis and proceed with a going through the process for a new ordinance to ban them, or you could say, I don't support this ordinance. I to go forward and process another ordinance to ban them. Okay. Uh, so I think those are really two choices. It, it's, it's too, I think it's too far a leap for us to take, to go from this to a motion to ban them. Uh, I think we need to go back to the business impact okay. process. Okay. Well, I, um, that's, uh, I think that's where I'm going to be today. I'm not going to support this because I think there should be a total ban on short-term rentals. So that's, that's my comments. Yes, sir. Yeah, I had one of those on my street. I live in a non gated community right behind the boulevard. It's as uh, okay. close as you can get to the strip and um, no gates. And uh, we had one of those on our street. We were lucky because uh, it was convention overflow. That's what that was used for. We were lucky. They weren't very noisy. They really weren't noisy at all. They came and went. They never had more than six or eight people. So something was working on that particular kind of thing. And so maybe there's a purpose to this bill. Maybe it is to, it isn't a liberalization of uh, what's existing at this point. I'm not going to vote for it either, by the way, just to set your mind at ease until we know more about this, because it's been over a year, actually, since we discussed this. And I remember being very uncomfortable with the short-term model because you couldn't control it um, and couldn't enforce it. Uh, things like this, they, they lead us into other areas. Uh, for example, Pete, uh, this house is a, a residential area. How's it taxed as a residence or an uh, income producing property? Well, it, it, I would say it probably pays this city on average of about uh, anywhere from 1000 to 2000 yeah. per month in, in tax. What about property tax? Um, that I would assume probably the current the value being somewhere around 600,000. So, you know, um, I mean, it, it's the house to the city as far as from a revenue perspective is probably bringing in um, probably 15,000. The thing is, it's, it's maybe, it may be treated by the assessor as a residential subject to the 3% increase in the tax per year, but I have a feeling that it's and it's being treated that way, and it should be subject to the 8% per year increase. Um, I'm not sure how far back they can claw on the back taxes, but it sounds to me as if, and I'm going to bet, because it's typical, this is the kind of thing that does find a way to get around the rules. So I'm going to ask our staff to check with the assessor's office to verify um, exactly how this is being taxed, to make sure that, in fact, it is taxed as an income-producing property. Um, not as a residence, not as a single family residence. And uh, that's one thing. And then, um, you, you did make a statement about the only record was for the people calling the police, that they were trying to build a record, as you pointed it out. Well, that's what people do, that's what they're supposed to do. We, we tell people to do that. Uh, whether it's 311 or 911, we tell them to build a record because that's their only protection. 
And as you know, when there is no zoning out there, we haven't got enough staff to be out there enforcing code, you know, at night, in the middle of the night, and then on weekends. And so there's a level of trust built between people who have businesses and people who, who uh, govern them. And in this particular case, you shouldn't be saying that they weren't doing the right thing, but in fact, they were doing the only thing. Whether they called you or not, I don't know. I mean, who knows? But the thing is that they did the right thing because you do need to build this kind of a record in order to be able to establish that something wrong is happening. Um, I'm not sure you broke any laws. I don't know about that. But I do know that uh, it's a good example of why we don't and shouldn't have short-term rentals in residential neighborhoods. And so um, you know, I'm, I'm glad we were getting there because I was worried about my neighborhood having uh, one and then having another and another. I, I don't know how we would control that. So that's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. I have a motion to obey. Uh, uh, well, to uh, let me ask a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, what does the flame or vow? What does the other jurisdictions ordinance speak to short-term rental, or in the case of these residents, party houses? In fact, Department of Planning, here in the Valley, Clark County does not permit short-term residential rentals. City of Henderson only permits them at Lake Las Vegas, but does not permit them anywhere else in the City of Henderson. City of North Las Vegas, their ordinance does not speak to short-term residential rentals. It doesn't address it one way or the other. So in the Valley, that's what the other jurisdictions do. Okay. In the City of Las Vegas today, how would you depict the city of Las Vegas allows short-term residential rentals as a conditional use in residential zoning districts. Up to? Up to? 30 days, 6 months? Short-term residential rental, by definition, uh, is any rental that's less than 31 days. So any, okay, so less than 31 days. Okay, so that's on a, so that's on a daily, 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 weekly. weekly. Okay, okay. Um, so I'm going to thank you and your staff for uh, doing your due diligence as far as wrapping this up because I know the councilwoman has struggled with this for a very long time and the more she attempted to flush this out the more party houses that continue to pop up uh, throughout the city of Las Vegas and I am uh, with my colleagues I'm up to here with party houses, affecting our residential community, really um, taking uh, these fine folks and others um, out of the comfort zone of where they live and rest each and every day in their neighborhood. And they're right. No way in the world would I put up with someone coming in and out, countless people, every other weekend enjoying my fine, nice, quiet community that I chose to live in for them to come in and enjoy themselves and disrupt my environment. It's no different than when residents come in and balk about tall buildings and structures that impede their view of Mount Charleston or Red Rock, right? The scenic views that they pay for to enjoy and then they have it impeded. This isn't to put a knock on the owners of this of this residence, um, or I should say this uh, commercial use, but this particular commercial use, in my opinion, does not belong in the fabric of our neighborhoods. And so therefore, I'm going to recommend, Val, as well as Flynn, that you all sharpen your pencils and your pens, and please bring back to this recommending board uh, an ordinance outlawing party houses in the city of Las Vegas. And we can have a discussion as it relates to um, the issues that may arise when that ordinance comes back from those, I'm sure, on the opposing side as it relates to supporting the party houses, but it is not something that I support as a representative sitting on this council. And so for that, what I going to suggest and recommend, and either one of my colleagues can, can make the motion, but I am not in support of this ordinance, and, and therefore I'm asking that you 
um, bring back an ordinance that um, outlaws party houses slash um, short-term rental to the recommending board. So, um, Councilman Anthony or Councilman Coffin, recommendation? Uh, I will move to, uh, uh, to deny this ordinance. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. One motion to request a Thank you. For your There's one other thing. The mayor, I was going to say in defense of the mayor, Fannie Lane can get there. It's just there's a gate on Rancho on that issue. So she can get in. So she doesn't live in a strict gate. Okay. Let me, let, me, let me say this also before you all leave. For the record, all of the bills, bills number 2013-463, will be eligible for adoption at the October 2nd City Council meeting. Um, bill number 2013-52, which we just covered, um, has been denied and will not come before the City Council. Actually, that's the one that we have. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said that wrong. Oh, let, me, let me correct the record just for a moment. I, I apologize. Bill number, I'm looking at the wrong number. I apologize. Bill number 2013-51 will not come before the City Council on October 2nd. Yep. Okay. It will. It will. That's, we'll that's my question. We we'll recommend with a, do, uh, with a not pass uh, recommendation. That's what will happen. Right. It'll be eligible for vote on October 2nd because you recommend denial. Okay. Not. okay. Then I, I, I stand corrected. I'm ahead of myself. And thank you for the correction, uh, Attorney. On that subject, the, the, the remaining bills 2013 through 2013 51 will be eligible for adoption at the City Council meeting on October 2nd, City Council meeting. However, this particular bill, number 2013-51, will come before the City Council with a recommendation of denial. Correct. That's for the record, to get the record straight. I'm sorry, Councilman. Well, that's, I wanted, that's what I wanted to clarify. This is going before the City Council for final vote on that day. At the same time, uh, there will be an ordinance drafted to come to recommending to prohibit short-term rentals in the city of Las Vegas. Okay. Yep. So I want to make sure everybody understands. The process will start. It won't be ready for introduction. Yeah, it will come eventually. Yeah. Right. Okay. Very good. Okay. okay. On that subject, That's Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to add. You know, Are we on the same subject? Yeah. yeah because so we actually have really make sense. Before we go to the next bill, I was just going to say that I really feel like uh, when we had these short-term rentals, it created because we were sitting in the convention town. That's the only reason. I remember in the 50s and 60s, the uh, radio broadcasts would go out asking for people to put folks up in their homes. And they were allowed. Um, that's how we broke into the big convention. We didn't have enough hotel rooms. Now we do have enough hotel rooms. Yeah, more than that. Yeah. Okay. But I remember it starting. We're now down to uh, bill number 2013-52 for possible action in next. A seven curfew specific to downtown Las Vegas sponsored by Mayor Sterling Gibbon. Staff? Committee hired Jim Lewis, Deputy City Attorney, City Attorney's Office. Uh, in a nutshell, we have an ordinance before you that uh, creates a special curfew area uh, in parts of downtown delineated by a map that you received with the First Amendment prior to this meeting. Uh, Basically, there's going to be a 9 p.m. curfew. It's proposed that it's a 9 p.m. curfew for the 7 to and under on public areas, streets, and sidewalks within that area. And there are exclusions from the curfew for Title 12 special events. Uh, if the parent or guardian is with the, the minor, uh, or if the minor is coming home from work, church, or school. Uh, I'm here for questions regarding the procedure. And uh, Karen Coyne is here to talk about the ordinance uh, generally. Good morning, Karen Coins, City of Las Vegas. So I wanted to make sure that you all have received the updated map. Um, this ordinance actually came about as a result of uh, a meeting with the downtown coordination team um, that was attended by 60 plus people in the community who primarily sponsor businesses in the downtown area. Um, they were highly anxious to work in partnership with our city staff on some solutions to a variety of challenges that have um, arisen in the downtown area as a result of great success. There's a lot of excitement in the businesses, bars, restaurants, activities, um, 
uh, entertainment activities rather, and uh, with that comes a host of challenges. Um, this group um, identified a host of issues from you know, alcohol-related events to, cur um, excuse me, to um, crowd control, to security issues, um, and we agreed very quickly within that structure that 60 people is a, a large group to try and manage. So there was a smaller task force put together that has been meeting on a weekly basis where the issues at hand were identified and some potential solutions were also identified. One of which was um, an opportunity to really address the most vulnerable of our participants in the downtown area activities, and that's the minors. Um, there was much discussion with this group about reflecting, um, de de developing an ordinance that would um, not mirror necessarily exactly, so it's a reflection rather, the county's ordinance um, that is, was imposed out on the strip several years ago um, to address the issue of minors. Um, what you see before you today, but for the amended version of the map, the original map certainly was much larger. It went um, US 95 to the north, around to Sahara on the south, excuse me, over to eastern, south to Sahara, and over to I-15. That has been amended to what you see before you today, and there have been a number of versions between that original introduced map to what you see today. Um, that affects, by the way, a population um, of 6,509 citizens, of which 10.8% or 705 are under the age of 18. So a couple of things that are important, I think, to draw out about this bill. There has been some confusion about whether or not this would impact with, with the attention to underage drinking. This is not an 18 to 21 year old bill. This is the under 18. This is the very young group of minors. That's what this bill would affect. This would not impact you if you were within your front yard, if you live within the areas of the boundary or on private property. Um, there were also some concerns raised, so I'd like to just pass this out as, uh, for reference, about the fact that this is in one of our most economically challenged areas of the city. And um, as a result of that, and also from a cultural perspective, it's a walkable community. Many people walk to the walk where they get the essential necessities. And um, I have additional notes here. Um, what we've done with this particular depiction is the same exact map. It just shows the variety of businesses that are available within the boundaries and beyond the boundaries. And you can see that there's a fairly well-balanced makeup of uh, businesses and various types of businesses um, directly within and, and immediately outside the boundaries. Um, with that, um, I'd be able to answer any of the questions you have, and I, and I may also want to ask Captain Anderson to be at the table. Um, Metro is certainly a strong partner of ours, and um, his agency is responsible for policing this area, whether it's a special event or any other night of the week. So with that, we're available to answer any questions. Okay. If you don't mind, before the captain speaks, commercial properties, are, are these the, the same? They're the same map. The difference, sir, is the overlay of the different types of business uses. There were some concerns about having access. If you couldn't walk through the identified boundaries of the curfew zone, you'd still be able to access businesses for necessities, food, gas, whatever type of uh, necessity. So this overlay just simply shows what type of businesses exist within the boundaries and what's available immediately surrounding the boundaries. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know, our response currently in the intro, Sean Anderson. Thank you. Um, is the downtown area command. And the downtown area command, as well as a lot of other area commands, has a growing concerns of violent crime. Inside of my area command specifically, uh, year to date, we're up 22% in assaults and batteries with deadly weapons. And I have 13 murders so far this calendar year in comparison to the six that I had at the same time last year. 
Uh, with all the tremendous growth and all the positive things that are happening in uh, downtown area command, we still struggle. It's still a living core. A lot of the popularity of the first Fridays, um, the entertainment, is drawing a lot more young people into an area that is not designed for them. And increasingly, they're finding themselves in situations that we don't want our children to be involved with. This is still a complicated, difficult area to police. And when we started looking for solutions, we looked to our, the business community, uh, other community partners, and as highlighted before, one of the solutions we talked about was curfew. We know that the curfew ordinance that was recently enacted in the county has been effective. And it's been very effective in helping control some of the issues that they've had on Las Vegas Boulevard. It's enforcement is one part of this picture. And us having the ability to um, intervene and, and talk to kids earlier in the evening and get them out of trouble, keep them out of situations that can land them in trouble is a big part of it, certainly. But even a bigger percentage of this is just getting the message out to a group of people that can't be down here after 9 o'clock at night. That's really the biggest part of this, is to get the message out and to have that tool in place. A lot of people might not understand the challenges of downtown. We've done such a good job in uh, making it a positive place and when your, your, your child comes to you and says, Mom, Dad, I'm going to go downtown, or you go on first Friday, there might not be a full expectation of what your, your kid is bumping into down there. As I said before, 22% increase in assaults with daily weapons in downtown area command. We still struggle to make things safe. This ordinance is, a, I think, a positive step in the right direction. Okay. Hold on one second, if you don't mind. Is there anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? So please come forward to state your name for the record. Thank you, Todd Fowler, 240 North King Street. I don't know anything about these maps that they're hanging out. All I know is what's written on the ordinance itself. And I've got some problems. First of all, Council made Fremont Street a, uh, a state park. I was against that. But I don't think that you ought to ban any ages from the state park. That's number one. Number two, I don't want any curfew around my area because it's a family area. We have no problems. Now, if you basically, whatever you want to do downtown, you do downtown. Wherever the hotels have that. But don't come around my neighborhood and start putting this stuff down on me. Now, if they want to draw a line, I don't care. 15th Street to take away the, the residential, the, to keep the residential neighborhoods out of it. I don't mind that. But, but I don't want them in my area. By the way, did I give my name and address? No. Talk no, no, no. Talk Hall of 240 North High Street Street. Thank you. And, and according to the map, Mr. Farlow, it doesn't look like your neighborhood made it into the boundary. Well, I'm just reading on the, on the ordinance itself. Okay. So, so Councilman Coffin, uh, you, I'm sure that you can, you know, you know the neighborhood well. If you, if you can come up with some, some stuff. The other thing is, I've been going to council meetings now for 17 years. And I just see the council handing out these liquor permits like they are ice cream cones because they're ripping it. The problem is, and, and in that 17 years, I counted three times that a liquor vendor was brought before the council to a answer for selling to money. So how these kids are getting their booze, I don't know. But if it's a vendor's fault, then go after the vendor. Reason my, and, and he, another thing is, the way I take it is, this ordinance came about because of 
of the difficulty that Metro has. And right now, if you have, if you have the police drawing up the ordinances, that is like the tail wagging the dog. The council ought to make the laws and just direct the police, these are the laws, enforce it. That's the way it, it, it should be. And I, 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 I reason that, or either reason or Mother Jones has, has got a, a, a short article in there that makes a point that every person in this country is a criminal at one time or another. We've got so many ordinances and, and, and stuff and signs to put it about, and that's, it seems like common sense is just being put on the back burner. Right now, if a, if a policeman observes uh, a minor disrupting downtown, he can stop and, and tell him right now, the law is open, just tell him to start behaving himself straight up and go home. He can do that right now. There doesn't have to be an ordinance to, to, to ban him down there. Right on that. I just, I have a hard time with that. But again, we have kids that go around our neighborhood they, because the only park that we have is a, a shared park over there at Hollingsworth Elementary, and the kids go over there, and they play frisbees out in the street with the dogs and stuff like that. They know that the parents are always sitting there, you know, we're looking out the, the window and that. I don't want to give the police, I don't want to have the police going around there harassing the kids. I mean, we've got to control them in the situation. I just don't want to give up my neighborhood. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah Councilman, I was going to ask you if uh, we could ask questions after the people who are proponents have had their say. So, mm -hmm. and then yeah, then yeah, 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 because I don't know if anybody else is in favor of your ordinance, because then I would like to ask you some questions of the proponents. Right, that's, that's why I wanted to have everyone speak so that we can gauge yeah. who's who, and then yeah. we can basically pull back yeah, up. Make sure everybody who's in favor speaks speak first, and then uh, those who are opposed will speak after. Well, I mean, we can just keep, I'll keep track of, of those. Okay so that we can keep the flow of the meeting going. Um, yes? Is that the Please state your name for the record. Good morning, everybody. I am Assemblywoman Dina Neal, and I am here uh, representing the Hispanic Caucus and also the African American Caucus. Um, I was glad that the map changed because um, I had a question in terms of the factual basis for which the, which the ordinance was made. But I still have an issue in terms of the scope. Number one, the scope of the language. Um, there's conflicting language in the actual ordinance. When you look at um, section one and then you look at section two, line six, you have these um, the, the barriers or the areas from the eastern border that's listed on that new map. Um, and then in section two, you have if a child is found anywhere in the public streets, avenues, or alley in any places in the city. So that's broad. So are we talking about this specific descriptive area that is outlined in the map, or are we talking about the entire city? Because if it is the specific area, then that, needs to, that language needs to be changed and adapted. In addition to that, it's also listed in section three, the words, or other places in the city, which is on line 19 in section three. So that's one of the problems. The other issue is in terms of the idling, wandering, or strolling. So the definition, number one, of what is idling in, in a city, number one, is not as vague and it's overbroad. And so I'm wondering, I would like to see an amendment um, to deal either with the definition of what is idling what is considered uh, wandering and strolling, because in section three it says that any peace officer who finds or observes a child. So that opens up the door that you see a child who's standing there for whatever reason, but you have to then stop the child and find out, are you coming from work? Are you coming from church? Are you coming from your parents' house? Did you get permission for whatever period of time that you're out here? And so, Although you have the exceptions carved out in the bill, it still, to me, opens the door for a broader um, occurrence to occur of, number one, profiling, 
and stopping children based on what they may not perceive as an illegal act. And we have described, to me, idling as an act that you cannot do within the city between these particular time periods. In Section 2, it goes to 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday. But then in Section 1, you have your 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., which has specific boundaries and borders. And I think we're going to get caught up into a lot of other situations. And then also in Section um, 3, which is Sub B, it continues to state that any peace officer finding or observing a child under 18 upon any place in violation of uh, the or sections 10.5401 through or 1.5 may cite the child. So although the language uh, that came before this paragraph stated that you know they will ask or try to take the child to the parent's house or exercise due diligence before taking the child to juvenile a detention center. The paragraph that is listed between 7 through 10 does not necessarily give that caveat or lay out the caveat that a citation will either be issued before that question is asked or after that question is asked. And if, we're, if we know that this is a culturally dominated community, meaning it is minority based, meaning that we already know that they, we have children whose parents work swing shift in the city who are not necessarily home and the parent is not there, then we're also, in my opinion, opening the door to this pipeline for kids to now have a record, whether it's for citing, for standing on the corner or whatever, but now they now have a citation as a juvenile for wandering the city or idling on the corner. Because an officer has to stop a child in order to ask that question. And those are my concerns, that the scope of the language is too broad and that it opens the door and there needs to be an amendment in terms of the language that we have and there needs to be a clarification that the specific boundaries are what is going to travel through all of this language and that this, the words the city needs to be stricken. And that's my statement. I'm in opposition to the ordinance. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak on this item? Yes. Go ahead, Todd. I'll Executive Director of the ACLU of Nevada. Let me echo the Assemblywoman's comments and uh, discuss, although the boundaries have changed apparently since this proposal was uh, made public, uh, it is my opinion that the boundaries should be defined by the problem as demonstrated. If young people are drawn to downtown, we need to know what the reason is. Sometimes we have to wonder if we are victims of our own success in promoting downtown and the activities that are there. But if the problem exists, define exactly what that problem is and let the boundaries reflect that problem. I share the concern also about the profiling potential for stereotyping. Why are youth in downtown treated any differently than those who might be residing in Summerlin or other neighborhoods throughout the city of Las Vegas? Uh, the pine, the, the fines and punishment as proposed, are clearly excessive in my opinion. Uh, this creates an undue burden on the family, the child, and as the assemblyman was saying, the record that the child will then have to bear as they go throughout the rest of uh, their, their years as a young person. The other issue is that there are frequently homeless and at-risk youth who are seeking services in these areas. They should not be targeted for further harassment and having to deal with the issues that might result by a run with the uh, law enforcement. Um, treating our youth as criminal and issuing them records of citation is not the right way to deal with this problem. And I would encourage you to reject this proposal as it is currently proposed and take it back and, and redefine it in a way that more, reflect, more accurately reflects the issue uh, as can be demonstrated here by the city. Okay. Good morning, Councilman. For the record, my name is Howard Watts III. I reside at 1701 South 14th Street, and I am the field director for the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada. Uh, I live within the original boundaries that were proposed, um, and I actually work within the, the current proposed boundaries on 6th Street uh, in between Gas and Garces. Uh, I also, I grew up, I was born and raised in Las Vegas, and I uh, went to the Las Vegas Academy, which is very close to the proposed curfew area. Um, 
I don't want to take up too much time, so I'm really going to focus on the, the bill that's presented as amended instead of uh, bringing up uh, the points that I had with the original bill, which I think if anyone saw lost in the report, he saw my general opinion on that. Um, going through the ordinance itself, um, you know, I actually appreciate this because it gave me a chance to really read what the current laws are. Um, in Section 3, uh, uh, subsection A, um, any child between the ages of 12 and 18 years is to be taken to the Clark County Juvenile Home, um, whereas a child under the age of 12 years um, is to be first um, brought to the parents unless they cannot be uh, located. So I actually um, want to see section, subsection A um, of section 3 amended to mirror the language of subsection B because um, I don't think that we should be taking 12 to 18 year olds to the juvenile home and filing a report um, if we can just bring them back home to their parents. Um, and that's, that's something that's currently in effect. Um, also, the proposed added language to um, Section 3, at the end of Section 3, um, it first lists citing the child for a violation and releasing them to their parents, then releasing the child and then taking the child to the Clark County Juvenile Court. Um, to me, the, the sequence of that uh, places a preference on finding the child instead of getting them back to their parents. So I would like at the very least that to be um, rearranged. And I think that it's important that we give direction to peace officers that on a first offense, if a child happens to be in the curfew zone but is otherwise not doing anything wrong, they should be brought, you know, they should be brought to their parents. They shouldn't be fined. They shouldn't be punished in any additional way. Um, so I think that we need to make it clear that uh, unless this is coupled with other issues or this is somebody who's habitually violating curfew laws and thus knows where and when they're supposed to be um, in, a, in an area, that we shouldn't be punishing them. I think we should make it clear in the ordinance that that's the case um, and not leave that discretion up to individual peace officers or the district attorney's office, um, you know, if you, you know, most people cannot uh, pursue a fine if they feel it's unjust, and often if they get a fine, they feel that they've simply broken the rules. So I think we need to make it clear uh, that for youth that uh, violate uh, this curfew one time without any other additional incident, that they just be brought home to their parents. Um, now in section. Five, uh, there is the fine uh, not to exceed $300. Um, once again, I think that that fine should either be eliminated or that it should be clearly laid out that that fine should not be assessed um, uh, for a child who has violated the turkey for the first time um, without any additional incident. Um, and then in section seven, uh, it notes that anything uh, deemed unlawful can be punished by a fine of not more than $1,000 or imprisonment for a term of not more than six months or a combination thereof. Um, and this allows the punishment of the parents. Um, and once again, it's something that I think is too broad in its potential application. And it needs to be narrowed once again to uh, only affect parents that are um, facing severe difficulties in um, raising their children. I don't think that, you know, under the, the ordinance as proposed, a child uh, that goes to um, Casa Don Juan for dinner with their friends um, and is out past the curfew can be detained, fined, brought to uh, their parents, and their parents can be fined $1,000. That's a $1,300 maximum fine um, to that family. And then they have to contest it if they feel it was unjust. So uh, those are the changes. Additionally, I have a map that I'd like to submit to the council with much more narrowly defined boundaries, um, essentially going from Maryland up through the plaza and covering one to two streets on each side of Fremont. We know that this is where the most activity is going on, so I am not opposed to having a more strict curfew. But once again, even with those within those defined areas, Let's get children out of the area and not resort to fines and other punishment. 
right off the bat. And then finally, you know, I think that uh, comments about looking at packaged liquor, um, you know, cracking down on people who are providing alcohol to minors in the downtown area, um, you know, investigating that and cracking down on that. Uh, I know some young people are bringing alcohol into the area, but if anyone's providing it within the area, I think we should be focusing more of our enforcement efforts, cracking down on that and cracking down on our youth. Okay. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on the side of the sofa? Please come forward and state your name for the record. Um, I'm Terry Murphy, 516 South 6th Street, representing the downtown Las Vegas line. In the meeting where this ordinance was proposed, there were approximately 60 people all on the one side of attempting to provide a solution quickly to um, a myriad of issues that are facing downtown safety. And I think in our haste to try to do something good, we may have gone, uh, gotten ahead of ourselves in terms of not reaching out to the community uh, that lives downtown. And so I do believe, and the Downtown Alliance does support, a curfew or ordinance that mirrors what Clark County has on the strip because if you are 17 years or younger, there are certain places that you shouldn't be on weekend nights. Um, with regard to some of the issues that have been raised here, uh, one, the map obviously has changed by um, dialogue with different groups and different people, but it's happened quickly. And so what I want to make clear is that it was never intended to um, harm any, any group or any individual. I think we're dealing with um, some situations downtown caused by a variety of issues which are not on the agenda today um, that we all have to get our arms around. I think that we should be, we as Downtown Alliance and the groups that are working to resolve these issues should reach out um, in a better way to the other groups that are affected. I do believe um, that valid points have been raised here this morning, but I also believe that the ordinance in some form should move forward, whether it moves forward tomorrow or whether it moves forward after a further discussion, um, I do believe it needs to move forward. And so, um, again, it was with all good intention, and I think staff did an incredibly good job in a short amount of time, but there have been valid issues raised here this morning. So, um, again, we support a curfew ordinance. We also support as many tools as we can give to Metro. Um, there were 132 Metro officers um, on Fremont Street last first Friday. There are not enough officers. And you know, we have more people downtown and more businesses, which is a very good thing. Um, but we don't have more officers. Finally, um, the Downtown Las Vegas Alliance is working diligently to come up with solutions to all the issues facing downtown. We're, work, we're going to um, the International Downtown Congress in a couple of weeks. We're going to hear from downtowns all across the globe. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. I think we can have a positive environment for families, for visitors, um, we just have to take things one step at a time and be careful how we do it. Okay. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on the If so, please come forward and state your name for the record. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Dimitrios Karapanagiotis, uh, 3900 Paradise Road, on behalf of Boy Gaming. Okay, uh, if you don't mind just spelling your name for the record. <laughs> first, name, first name D I M I T R I O S, last name K A R A P A N A G I O T A S. Thank you. Uh, here on behalf of Boy Gaming, and we are in support of the in concept of the uh, ordinance, and uh, also I'd like to submit for the record a letter from uh, Mr. Steve Thompson on behalf of Boy Gaming in support of the ordinance. Thank you. Okay, great. Anyone else wish to speak on this item? If so, please come forward and state your name for the record. Seeing none, public comment, public comment is closed. Council? Yes, I have a question. 
May I be here? Yes. Yes, you may. Right. You have the floor, sir. Well, that's about time to I know. I've been involved in volcanic ever since this thing came out. I, uh, <laughs> I went to one of the meetings, uh, part, partially, uh, and uh, understood and, and agreed the concept of uh, getting the curfew downtown, uh, where you have the problem. And uh, then, I, I don't know, a week or so later, out pops this humongous, uh, what appears to be uh, virtually the old citywide map, creating this with no, no consultation to Ward 3, no, no mention to Ward 3 or Ward 5, I'm told, uh, which created a huge problem for the council members in this area, trying to explain something that we had no hand in creation. And it was overbroad. I mean, every, every uh, alley, when I was a kid in this area, okay, the old man again, uh, I knew every alley, every avenue, every street, every, they wouldn't have a rule then, but you know what I'm saying, that I could evade any police officer that I chose at any given time, but there was no particular reason to do that because I had places to go. So what we are missing here is something that's not in the bill, but I'll just make brief mention of. We need a distraction elsewhere to pull kids on any Friday and Saturday away from that area, but also particularly on First Friday. You know, get them out of there. That's something else. We could work with First Friday on that. It's really overkill. Um, even with this greatly reduced map, which I'm very appreciative of staff uh, carving up, it still, it still covers the transit. The main transit um, corridor is Charleston. So people moving back east and west across the Charleston will have to run a gauntlet of being essentially out, out, outside the law to cross from east to west and vice versa. And that's, that's one thing. Uh, I've always believed that you try to solve a problem with a solution applied to the problem, not to everywhere else, where there may or may not be a problem. But we have a clearly identified problem on Fremont Street. And our law enforcement is understaffed right now. I think, Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, you're, you're like 30 or 40 officers under understaffed right now. Uh, at our high in 2010, I had 141 officers today. I have 120 assigned to my area. Today. Okay, so you're 20 plus uh, understaffed right now in a city that's added population. So I felt in the early stages of discussion here, and I participated again, as I say, for part of the first meeting, that a curfew and some sort of enforcement mechanism along Fremont Street and maybe a block or two on either side from Maine to um, to some street to the east, whether it's 12, 13, 14, 15, that would be appropriate because that way we have an identified problem in that area. We have a problem. Um, the genesis of the problem, whether it's package or liquor brought in, it doesn't matter. But there is a problem. Um, the other places, I don't think we've identified a problem except for an occasional fight or disruption or uh, a, a kind of assault and battery, whatever it is. I mean, crime happens everywhere. But we don't have an organized effort where we get people in one particular place, except along Fremont Street, and then during those once a month First Friday celebrations. So I don't know why the map didn't just simply embrace Fremont Street, a block or two in each direction. Because I guarantee you, with you being short staffed, how would you have enforced the largest of these maps? You can't enforce this map because there's still 30 or 40 points of entry now here into it. Um, so I think we've got to narrow this map down to where the problem is so that you could really enforce it and not have to be wondering about what your officers are doing over on South 6th or, or maybe over in Hundreds because while that's not in the area, they might have spotted somebody they thought might be a problem and kind of following. So it can happen. Uh, Council, we went, we went through, and there's been a lot of good feedback on this particular issue today. Um, certainly things that uh, need to be added to the conversation. When we talked about the boundaries of this map, um, as you know, it changed considerably over the course of the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, the boundaries of this map were a combination of concerns from the police um, placing this area in our high crime areas, in areas that we have traditionally experienced violent crime, and also the business community we did not have some of these areas included, but people from the Arts District indicated that they wished um, their area to be included in this curfew area. We tried to pare it down to areas to where we thought we would have the, the, the most impact. 
and within a definable space. If you look at the boundaries here, um, they're pretty common sense boundaries, easily identifiable. So that's some of the things that went into the construction of, of this particular map. We also wanted to um, get our hands around the issue of, uh, of, of displacement. If you make your boundary um, tiny and small, then it's a simple thing for a young person to step to the other side of the boundary, still be in the same general area, still be exposed to the same dangerous situations, just by, for lack of a better term, just moving to the other side of the street. So these boundaries were kind of constructed to prevent some of that from happening as well. Well, that's defense in place and defense uh, and drone. You know how it goes. Yes, uh, you don't have enough people to, to scout beyond your boundaries, if you will. My, my thought, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, to try to speed this up, that I am in favor of an ordinance. I do not like the penalty size. It's horribly big. And I didn't realize the curfew violation fine had gotten so big since I was a kid. It was amazing. It's, it's a recommended range. And now, this is really something that that's the court's job to determine what the punishment is. Granted, yeah, that's true, Cap. But on the other hand, that means a parent has got to go down to the RJC, find a place to park, take off half a day of work to go to the courts to appeal to the muni judge. And, and they can do that. And, and our judges are good and they're, they're going to be generous, but fine. And there's an administrative assessment on top of it. So even if you reduce it, reduce it to 100 bucks, there's still a big administrative assessment on top. I think the admin assessment on the 300 would be at least another 100. So now you're talking 400. So, you know, I don't know how bad of a move the judge would be in that particular day and if he's uh, rough and tough or just being generous. But uh, I'd like to try to get that number down. I didn't really want to say why, but the curfew number had gotten so big. So that's a, that's objectionable to me as someone who's grown up here. These citations also offers the opportunity for families that are struggling um, with kids that are acting outside of the bounds to be plugged into um, some good counseling, some good community programs, and some things to solve the problems. So it's not necessarily always punishment, but oftentimes this provides an opportunity for our system to plug kids into bad and needed programs and to turn things around before they become worse. It's not just punitive. Oftentimes this is positive. You're right. I agree, uh, Mr. Chairman. And by the way, I'll be proposing a Department 7 for our municipal courts. Uh, one of these days, I should have gotten to you first, but as long as the subject has come up, which will work in these very same things, as I have seen some of the specialty courts in our duty courts. Yes, for, people's lives. For, for involving parents, forcing yes. parents to be involved. Personal experience there. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, much of the bill is objectionable, but on the other hand, we have a purpose, we have a need for some of this. We have no question. We, we've got to do something to make sure we don't ruin what we've created downtown. So I think we need something here in this vein. Just not scattered out so big. Okay. Councilman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, the, the boundaries that we have on this map, um, uh, this area is changing. It, there is a new atmosphere that's occurring in these boundaries. Uh, people are coming downtown. They're coming downtown to have a good time. They're coming downtown to drink. They're coming downtown to go to restaurants. They're, it's great people are coming downtown. I mean, that is absolutely awesome. But um, somebody under 18 on a Friday and Saturday night after 9 o'clock has no business being downtown. <laughs> There's no reason for them to be there. It's a drinking party atmosphere. There's no reason for anyone in this valley to come into this purple area on a Friday, Saturday night after 9 p.m. And uh, uh, a lot of people, Terry and a big group and Karen, you have come together this has taken a long time to identify this particular area as a place where people are coming to have a good time and under 18 year olds don't belong in here. It's worked on the strip, it's going to work here. Um, so I support the curfew. What kind of bothers me though about some of this stuff is that we kind of turn the conversation into um, identifying not the under 18 year olds, but the police officer. Uh, we automatically assume that the police are going to profile, that they're going to harass, that they're going to um, uh, arrest everybody in the curfew area um, 
and take them to jail. <laughs> That's not the case. That's not how it works. I'm sure Captain Anderson um, would talk about if this curfew were to pass, there's going to be a big educational component that comes first. Then there's going to be warnings. Then there's going to be citations, and the hardcore that are causing problems here are going to juvenile. That's normally how this works. So Captain Anderson doesn't have the manpower or the personnel to start rounding up everybody in the curfew area and taking them to juvenile. That's not how it works. There's warnings, just like any criminal um, uh, incident, the officer can warn, can cite, and can arrest based on that particular incident. So um, I, I have complete faith in the police department under Captain Anderson putting together a plan that is going to go through this educational warning, citation, arrest, component where we're not rounding up everybody. And if somebody is traveling in a car on Charleston through the curfew area, the last thing the police are going to do is stop that car and take everybody to jail knowing that they're just passing through. So um, uh, I think this is a great idea. I like the curfew. I like the area that you've identified because that's really the kind of the party element that's occurring. And um, I have no reason to believe that Metro is going to be professional, just like they are when they enforce any other statute in the city of Las Vegas. Okay. Do I support the curve just on the smaller? I, when I first heard of this and found out about the first draft of the boundary, I was quite shocked as, as far as the size and the scope and the depth of, of the boundaries of, of the first draft. And then I heard through the grapevine that um, there was going to be a more narrow in scope boundary, which is here before us today. Um, I find it quite interesting how, as my colleague Councilman Coffin mentioned earlier, how a lot of these conversations and decisions and ordinances being drafted were being done in our wards and we had no idea that these ordinances were even being drawn in our wards. And so for that I take uh, concern as it relates to ordinances being drawn in my ward and I have no knowledge of it. I don't think that's fair and I don't think that that's respectful. Um, I do know that in past history, whenever we have issues with specific areas of the community, there's crime stats that come before the council. Mapping, depicting the hotspot areas. I have yet to see um, the crime stats in the specific areas that we're talking about. I'm being told that, but in the past I was shown. And I'm yet to be shown that information, and for that, I'm not comfortable moving forward with this until I actually see what we're talking about, if in fact there are real problems. You know, the old parable, trust, but verify. So therefore, verify to me that there's an issue so that we can deal with the issue from the core working outwardly so that we can come up with a adequate boundary that fits the size, the scope of the issue that we're faced with here today. That's number one. Number two, there's a lot, and I went through this ordinance and I scratched it up pretty good because a lot of things just popped out at me and a lot of information the assemblywoman pulled forward that I had underlined and wrote my notes next to as well because it popped out at me as well in relation to section one, 10.54.015, one um, in relation to um, the children under the age of 18 standing on sidewalks, streets, parking lots, driveways, walkways. Well, let me just speak from a minority standpoint. 
growing up in Las Vegas, my brothers and I were standing in our driveway at home, throwing the ball from one side of the yard to the next. Who pulls up? Police. You all have no reason for being out front, and they attempted to take us to juvenile. No one on the street, we're in our front yard doing what kids do at night to play. My parents in the house, but we're standing in our driveway. So when I see this, that concerns me. So to say that it doesn't happen, oh, it does happen. It happened when I was a kid, and I know that it still continues to happen today, and that concerns me. So we need to clean this up a little bit in relation to Section 1. And if not, then that's something that I won't be able to support in this ordinance either. Section 2. Idling needs to be clarified. What does that mean? Wandering, strolling down avenues, alleys, public places. The city of Las Vegas created downtown. There was a reason why the Fremont Street experience came to be. Because as I was a kid, walking, running, playing up and down Fremont Street, eating the hot dogs, going to the movie theaters, enjoying the atmosphere of downtown, ice creams, what have you, the kids tend to, that live in this community tend to do the same thing that I did as a kid. Okay? So therefore, moving forward, the city of Las Vegas just recently approved a container park, the child's play area, in this same boundary. Great for downtown, right? So are we being contradictory now? Saying that kids under 18 don't belong in downtown? Well, if that's the case, why are we voting on things in downtown that are kid-friendly? That makes no sense to me. So that's contradictory. Really, really, what is the true message that we're trying to send here? Let's stop placating and be real about the conversation and basically deal with the true issues on the table. On one day, we want to be family-oriented, bring the entire family down the first Friday like I did with my family, and we stayed to midnight with my teenage son, who hooked up with a couple of his friends, and they wandered around first Friday. So does that mean now that I'm subject, subjected to a $1,000 fine and up to six months in jail with my child? Because according to this ordinance, that falls within the size and the scope of what we're talking about here today. And not just my family, any other parent or teenager coming to downtown for festivals. And I do know that it spells out on you know, certain occasions in the ordinance that it states that you know, the law won't apply, but there's a number of events that take place in the downtown community. What we as a council must do is, is determine what type of downtown do we want. And if we want to be a specific downtown, I hear that some say that we want to be a Bourbon Street. Others say we want to be a gas lamp. Right? What is it that we as a community want? What is it that we can collectively agree on so that we can start to really shape and mold the downtown into the community that we want while working closely with law enforcement as well as the downtown property owners and the business alliance to rid the community of those elements that exist as we continue to grow as a downtown. When I came on staff in 1999, downtown was not the downtown of today. I worked hand in hand with a number of captains from DTAC to Boulder, from the gang unit to Weed and Seed, to help clear the way and the path for what we have today. That was my job as a liaison. Reading downtown of the gangs, the prostitutes, the drugs, the boarded up, vacant, and abandoned buildings, preparing them for what we have today. And what we have today is something very special. Something that has brought a smile back to my face because it's starting to remind me again 
of the same community that I had an opportunity to play in when I was a teenager, a responsible teenager. And then we have a lot of responsible teenagers. But what we can't do is basically give up and basically paint all teenagers with the same brush guilty until proven innocent. I don't play that game. Never did, never will. The law in section six, which states that the penalties will be no more than a thousand dollars or by imprisonment of a term of not more than six months or by a combination of such fine and imprisonment. Really? Really? What crime is there so egregious that we have to penalize our young people, whether it be 901 or 1001, does this fine really equal the punishment? $1,000, six months, up to six months? Yes, the parents can go to municipal court and argue it, right? But do we really want to hit our kids with a $1,000 fine and then have them out of school and all the other ills that come with them being in juvenile for six months? Really? No. I can't agree with that. I, I can't agree with that. So this ordinance, in my opinion, has a lot of work yet to be done. I do want to give the creators of the ordinance and those that worked on the ordinance an applause for at least taking a bite of the apple to assist the city of Las Vegas in addressing uh, the issues that I've been told, but I'm yet and still waiting to be verified as it relates to the stats itself, so that I have something in writing to work with. And um, along with Councilman Coffin, I, I, I believe just from what I've been told and not shown, that the size and scope of the area in question um, is too large right now. If, if I had to redraw it, it wouldn't, it would more than likely be somewhere in the parameters of the young man that came before us uh, with the boundaries that are here today, but that's only because of what I've been told. It may broaden depending on what facts come back as it relates to my office being fully briefed on this ordinance that's before, that's before recommending here today. So with that, uh, I am going on the record not supporting the ordinance here before the recommending meeting today. Those are my comments. Councilman? I was wondering if maybe, because there's some good things in this ordinance, because rather than just submitting it forward to the council with a, with a, a recommendation of, uh, of no, that maybe we wait a little while and smooth it out before we send it to council, simply because an ordinance, I think the changes are necessary. There are some. I've, I've been down there and I have seen some problems occurring. I don't have stats like you, but I've seen anecdotally, uh, in my, my own eyes, uh, disruptions. And I know from talking to the police that there are, they're emerging a, a little turf battle and who gets to sell drugs to who. And, and this kind of thing can create fights. Um, so, uh, one other, oh yes, one other thing. Uh, you mentioned it's been made about the curfew on the boulevard. How weird is that, Captain? Uh, how far uh, on either side of Las Vegas Boulevard does that curfew span? I'm counseling. I can't say specifically where that boundary is. Is it just the street itself? I believe mean, it's just on the boulevard. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> talking on the strip here? No, I'm not talking on the uh, um, for the record, Brian McCallum and the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. The other one from Sahara all the way down to Russell Road on the strip, all the way over to Industrial to Paradise Road, and then it's in zigzag. So it goes about five or six miles. The, the question that I have is how many residential properties reside within the boundaries of the strip? Councilman, I, I, I can't answer that right now. Okay. How many residential properties reside within the scope of the map that's shown here today? Because I see everything from entertainment, food and beverage, 
retail, wholesale, neighborhood shopping, restaurants, retail stores, and services stations, but I don't see residential, single family, or so we multi, multi, multi use. So, do we know the number that resides within that number? 6,500 people reside in that neighborhood, okay. which 705 or 10.8% are under the age of 18. Okay. That live within the boundary? Yes. Okay. Well, close to the Okay. I understand a motion? Sure. Councilman Barnes. Yes. If I may make a suggestion, would you, you, would you, uh, you may consider your your name? or an honest answer that you see manager? I'm sorry. Thank you. Well, in this advance for 30 days, so we can go back and maybe refine it, get a little bit more input from your offices, and bring it back to you for one, that, one, more, one last time before we go before, 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 we go before the full city council. I would be in support of that. Mm -hmm. But that would be underneath a motion. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, please. Val Steve, Deputy City Attorney. Just wanted to uh, clarify. <clears throat> I think some of you may remember this, but anything that is between brackets is coming out. So if you look in sections two and three, there was quite a bit of discussion about some of the language in there, and that's existing language that's proposed to come out. So um, although we do, need some, we do need some cleanup work, we don't need to worry about anything that was between the brackets. I saw that. Thank you. I'm used to that. So. The language that we hold this item, and I'm not sure what the correct language is to obey, or whatever, uh, at least uh, 30 days. And um, we're not blaming the police on this, by the way. They didn't go on that. <laughs> they just said they could enforce whatever we did. So it's a, it's a motion to obey for 30 days. Is that the uh, 15th, Kevin? Okay, it looks like the 16th of October. Okay, 16th. Motion is on the floor to, to obey for 30 days to the 16th of October. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No. One opposed. Okay. Motion passes. Okay. Now we're down to citizens' participation. Anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item may come forward. Anyone? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you, Chuck Father, 240 North High Street. I hope that you review this for the next 30 days. You address the latest problem in the wording. It says other places in the city. You know, it, it doesn't say the, the defined area. It says in the city. I mean, let's clean up that wording because, uh, because you made a, a good point on that. And thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else from the public wishes to speak on this item to come forward? It is the 15th, by the way. Oh, yes. 15th. That's our day of our first meeting. Okay, and for the record, the... Yeah. It's recommended. Recommended. It's a recommended. I'm sorry. Yeah, recommended is the 16th. the council meeting is the 16th. Okay, so for the record, the 30-day advance will be October... 15, not 16. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to conclude. I'll move here. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Right. Right. So moved.